morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, first of all, thanks again for that great libation. Uh, very powerful and perfect for an introduction. Um, again, my name is Jared Ball. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, and thanks especially to the African Psychology Student Association and to the e-board. Thanks to Dr. Humphrey and to my brothers, Drs. Bolden and Williams for this invitation. Uh, it is indeed an honor uh, and I'm grateful for uh, what was just mentioned, the previous invitations and even being bestowed, I think my only actual honor. I think like an actual, the only time, I think that's the, t the when, when you all, I got, and I still have it. I should have brought it with me. I should, I should always have it, the master teacher award. I was like, what? No, anyway. But anyway, so it's an honor to be back here and to, and to, to join this conference and be part of this conversation. Um, I also want to say thanks to the conveners of this conference for the, especially for the gathering that was convened last night uh, that was mentioned a little while ago. Um, the bringings of the mothers and the aunties to the conversation uh, was extremely powerful. Um, and being of a certain age, raised here in Maryland in particular, I mean, I remember, I mean, uh, the, the passing of Len Bias was, was absolutely a cornerstone. Um, and like others of other generations have said about whether it was like, you know, I don't know, Dr. King or Malcolm, or even, you know, people talk about where, where were you when John F. Kennedy was, was killed? You know, I remember exactly where I was when the news broke of Bias's death. Um, and it was jarring. Um, and I think was probably the first time in my life that I that I experienced what maybe people of this generation's experience, unfortunately, with Kobe. Uh, but that idea that uh, uh, the idea that Len Bias could die at all to a teenager who grew up admiring his his performance on the court. Um, and people don't, I, I mean, I hope people real, I, I tell my students all the time, people don't realize like there may very well not have been an Air Jordan had there not been the passing of Len Bias. Len Bias was the dominant ACC East Coast king. Uh, he was the one talking about deals with, with whatever tennis shoe and all this other kind of stuff. And he would have been undeniably a, a dominant force that may have changed even that course of tennis shoe and superstar and all the discussions of the GOAT that still happen today. So anyway, um, I also happened, oddly enough, to have been in, and this is very odd in the way I think that drugs interact with colonized communities. I happen to have been in a drug treatment facility with someone and admittedly claims and stories get told in these places, you know, as you could imagine, might be told anywhere where you can't verify things. Um, but I was told that that one of the th those involved in bringing those drugs to Lynn was a, a friend of this guy I was in here with. And his and I'll never forget forget what he told me about the reaction to the drug using community after Bias's death. And it was less find the guy that sold him the dope, not to punish him, but to get that version of the bag that's being distributed. Because if it could kill Lynn, it would make me a, a more seasoned user really enjoy it. You know, so that, that became the targeted bag that people wanted, the bag that killed Lynn. Let's get some of that. Anyway. All that to say, I come here this morning just to bring up two points in particular, and then I, I hope maybe we can engage in some conversation about it um, that, that unfortunately do relate to, to even what I've just said here. Um, the first point is that to truly understand the black athlete and its invention and the extending psychological circumstance in which this invented being finds itself, it is necessary to understand colonialism and the relationship colonialism generates between the colonized, in this case, African and or African diaspora people, and the colonizer, in this case, European, European descended and or white ruling elite. 
The black athlete is an extension of the colonial process, the conquering of land and labor, the suppression of consciousness, and the establishment of a new colonized consciousness or worldview. This is, this is the context as Europe set itself up and people and its people as having legitimate dominion over the world and the setting of everyone else to patterns of behavior in relationship to that dominion. If, as Malcolm X once asserted, the Negro is an invention of the white man, then the black athlete is too an invention similarly of that colonial process. Specifically, as Ben Carrington has said, quote, the black athlete was created on December 26, 1908 in a boxing ring in Sydney, Australia. For the following hundred or so years, this new representation would provide one of the most important discursive boundaries through which blackness itself would come to be understood. This powerful phantasmic figure, the black athlete, had been a long while in the making it was the product and perhaps the logical endpoint of European colonial racism, its constitutive parts forged from a combination of pre-existing, centuries-old racial folklores, religious fables, and the scientific tales of 19th century racial science. The recently institutionalized, putatively meritocratic arena of egalitarian male competitive sports, the emergent of a nascent global communication network, and the development of a cinema as of cinema as spectacle provided the social mechanisms for its conception. So in other words, if I may simplify, at a time when the colonial apparatus had been fully imposed, land labor, geography conquered, divided, new technology developed, this new purpose or this new thing called the black athlete invented out of a colonized African is imposed on the world. So I think it's important actually that Carrington describes the black athlete as an it. Because in the function, at least as I understand it, in the context of this colonial setting of the relationship, this hostile relationship, what we see performing, even as we enjoy it, even as we aspire to it, even if we are impressed and moved by it, is itself a construct meant to play a particular role in this society. And that role, unfortunately, is antithetical to the work happening at this conference and those gathered here. That is the, as we even just heard in that, that brilliant libation, the, the, the restoration of identity, the reestablishment, not as I at least understand as an outsider looking in at African and black psychology to, to, to teach African people how to situate themselves and, and accept their colonization, but to mentally prepare themselves to interpret their reality and organize it out of resistance or out of existence is at least how I understand the project that many of you are engaged in. So the, the African, the humanity, the context and spirit in which human beings and Africans conduct themselves athletically only existed prior to 1908 or the 500 year preceding period that established the groundwork for 1908. Today, much like Armand Town says of black people broadly, the black athlete has become a medium or the media that allows for whites to understand themselves as colonizers and as Africans to understand themselves as colonized. The black athlete, so that's point one. Sorry, that was just point one. Point two, the black athlete was invented for the colonizer and, and the colonizing process, which involves, but is not limited to, the projection of black capitalist fantasy, the neo-colonial projection of national progress or inclusivity, and to diminish the threat of rebellion while pacifying the colonizer as audience, ownership, investor, and advertiser. So consider, and this is really the, maybe the only mainstream commercial media product that I actually encourage African people to engage. I know many of us engage a lot of media that we probably shouldn't, some of it is even not the worst, but doesn't fully <laughs> fit the category of let's advocate it. But this is one, and one of them is, is the uh, Ezra Edelman created um, series about OJ called OJ Made in America. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. Has anybody in here seen that? 
that series, OJ Made in America, a couple of people, maybe. I really encourage, I used to use it in my classroom. I would encourage people to go back and watch it. If, if for no other reason, at least the first and maybe second episode, because I think it does better than anything I've seen in commercial media, really explain the context of what a black athlete means to white America. So it's not fully designed to justify OJ and his behavior, but it's to help us understand. And Ezra, you know, shout out to my, you know, half black Jew brother, you know, maybe he was speaking to both communities. Cause I do think in some ways he's clearly talking to whites and in some cases he's clearly, I think, talking to African people. And he's saying, listen, if you really want to understand how this thing works, you first have to understand. It's almost like what, 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 what uh, Schomburg told Clark when he first met. If you really want to know why you were written out of history, you have to understand why, what European history is. And if you want to really understand what happens to the black athlete, it is important to understand what the black athlete means to white America. And this series does such a good job of setting that up. So when you see the he, he brings you out to USC and to, to the 1960s L.A. And, and shows you the the the. I mean, literally on the other side of of, uh, of um, uh, what is the, the Coliseum, there's super privileged white America. And then there's the hood right on the other side and showing you the bifurcation and showing you how whites needed this college team. It's not just going to this elite college. It's having the best team. And what's going to get you the best team? A bunch of OJs. So, yes, we don't want black people writ large, but we want OJ. So Ezra Elderman described sports and described what for white L.A., for what sports meant for white L.A. Football is more important, as he says in the documentary, than life or death. It's importance to the sense of white leadership, white rule, dominion, all buoyed by the performance of their black athlete, their invention of an acceptable colonial figure. Or as is said later in, one, in that first episode, just talking about how OJ was acceptable as a Hertz uh, rental car ad, uh, ad representative, that he was an African, but with European features. They literally, the white dude is on there. He can't wait to say it. He's like, the director, he was beautiful, OJ was. He's, he was an African book with European features. And they talk about how they put the old, some of you are of a certain age might remember the commercial, they put the old white woman in the commercial saying, go OJ, go! To make whites feel comfortable about seeing this black man run through the airport without scaring them. <laughs> go OJ, go! And I think she represents, like in that scene, she's like all of whiteness in that scene. Like, you're going, you're doing this for us, OJ. Um, and then, you know, he becomes the conquered trophy or the totem that brings them more luck, but also more meaning. And then we have children in the room, so I'll clean this up. But there's a scene, one of my favorite scenes in this first episode. There's a white a former white friend of OJ recounting a story that OJ that he's he, he experienced with OJ where, where he and OJ are sitting at some restaurant, some fancy outing, and OJ tells him about how he had been sitting somewhere and he overheard one uh, a woman, uh, a white woman at a neighboring table say, hey, look at look at those ends sitting with OJ. And the white dude said, oh, OJ, that must have been so offensive. You, you must have been so hurt. That was such a horrible thing. And he said, no, OJ turned to him and said, no, don't you get it? They didn't see me as the ends. They saw me as black. And I'm sorry, they didn't see me as black with the ends. They saw me as OJ. And the white dude turns and he says, at that moment, I knew he was effed. And the white dude got it. The moment you give yourself up, the moment that full, the, the full acceptance of the colonial identity and the function and the, the conscious decision to benefit from it. Could you, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a make this work for me. That was the, the, the white dude got it. This is the moment you are from, from my vantage point, politically, culturally, consciously, you are ruined.
you, you it's, it's it's over for you. It, that it is. It actually, I'm, I'm reminded in that in that series, it's also valuable because in addition to the director of the documentary, you get the the Hertz, I guess CEO or whatever owner who's talking about it, and and you can just see them in their own words and in their own body language just conveying how much oh this was so oh it was so perfect and he sold so many rent he rented so many cars for us he made so much money oh anyway and then he became a, a huge spokesperson and, and commercial success um and then something else happened <laughs> yeah, we could just you know anyway something else happened um so this is this is part of what becomes the political and what I know Frank Wilderson and others have talked about in terms of the libidinal economy of sports. So there is a political economy. There is a that extractive we take we we create ghettos and then we take out of the ghetto only those who can perform certain tasks in certain ways and behave in so, I mean even if you go back and look at not only the history of Jackie Robinson breaking the so-called color barrier but in the history specifically of how and why he was the selected one, which had as much to do with his demeanor and his behavior as it did his talent on the field. And then, of course, politically, of course, he's unfortunately used to speak out against Paul Robeson uh, in defense of the U.S. state, which is ultimately what I think is the real the part of the political economy of sports, the extraction, the creation of the colony, the extraction from the colony, that which will produce wealth both materially and immaterially for the colonizer, and then ultimately to be there to play a role in service of the state in keeping people in a certain political line. The libidinal economy, of course, is the, the, that, that sort of, that, that immaterial, uh, um, I don't know, pseudo psychosexual colonial type of, we need that physical performance that we can't do, but we need it only in that way. Because because I always like to joke, imagine, you know, a politically radical, educated and organized LeBron James coming at you with a rifle instead of a basketball. Terrifying. And I'm even imagining him on my team and it's terrifying. That's like, good God. So you you see that it's like, please put that, get that man a basketball. please. We don't want him anywhere else. All right, so this is sort of what I'm saying about the function and fame of celebrity, and then I can sort of quickly uh, draw to a, 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 a close here. We can maybe have some discussion. Um, but I'm talking a little bit about the function and fame, of fame and celebrity in this colonial context. And this is why, as I've often argued, you can never have a situation where someone is, is simultaneously rich, famous, and politically radical. And I would argue, I still argue, there has never been an exception to this rule. This is not necessarily a negative judgment of any individual. It's just a simple fact about the position of celebrity in this society. You cannot be rich, famous, and politically radical. As soon as you, maybe one of the three, maybe two of the three, but as soon as you start to try to blend all three, invariably something happens. And this is why, just a quick um, uh, inexhaustive list of things. This is why, as I started, we get Jack Johnson, the, origi the original invented one, being depicted and distributed through media as this very dark-skinned, big, son of the formerly enslaved, representative of all the colonized and the enslaved, beating up white men, and then taking their young women across state lines. The whatever we think about interracial dating, whatever we think about whatever those age differences were, and got a lot of problems with all of this, um, that wasn't what caused Jack Johnson his problem. It was that he was first beating up the standard of the colonial dominant male and then having the nerve to walk off with their women. You get Jesse Jones both promoting U.S. democracy abroad against the, 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 uh, Hitler and the Nazis, but then coming home to speak out against John Carlos and Tommy Smith. You get, as I said, Jackie Robinson integrating Major League Baseball, uh, which could be argued to also be said to be part of the devolution of the Negro Leagues and any sort of sense of autonomy and 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 although there's contradictions there as well. And then, of course, we come out to speak against Paul Robeson. Um, uh, 
speak out against Paul Robeson, while now there are almost no black ball players in the major league sports, which is very interesting. Now, if we get into what I'm going to read a quick passage of in a moment, the history of colonialism in Latin America, we understand why black, black ball players have been replaced by Latin American ball players uh, and saving only a little bit of room for the good white American to have a little bit of room left uh, in their national pastime. Uh, but that is also a colonial, uh, uh, I think is, is easily explained or best explained through, a, through understanding colonialism. This is why we get Serena Williams being called the N-word and having to suffer all else that has been said about her. This is why we get Naomi Osaka needing a break. This is why we get Ye being pitched up to speak about Jews, uh, which is less about solving a problem than having Ye or Deshaun Jackson or Kyrie Irvin as stand-ins for legitimate discussion of the relationship between any group. This is why we get the malice in the palace. And I just watched the documentary again last night and was enraged all over again. Do you know I was teaching in, in undergrad? Do you know student? I had students, even a couple of black students, come to my class and tell me <sighs> that Ron Artest was still wrong and not justified in his response after having beer thrown on him. I will never accept that. I will never accept that. I will never, I told them that day, I said the president of my university could walk in right now and throw a beer on me and it's a problem. It's a major, major, and I am not a violent person at all. Please, please, people who know me at all, like this, I am the first to walk away, first to be like, nah, I don't want that, I don't want that. But you throw something on, I mean, if you really want to see what Jared would, you know, it's like if that, like if you really want to see what somebody's going to do, that's a good way to do it. And then they did it again. Like you watch the video, they threw it on him again. No, sir. And then the dude, the, the chubby dude walks down and goes on to the floor to stand up with him. My man, are you serious? And then has the nerve to come back on the documentary to be like, why he swing on me? What you talking about? You, you, ooh, 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 ooh. Oh man, what did Cedric the Entertainer say? White people say, I hope they don't. And black people say, I wish he would. <laughs> I never felt more about blackness when I wish he would. Wish he would. No. Anyway, sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> then you get Mahmoud abdul Rauf, and I hope you all saw that new documentary. Not that I support all of these commercial media outlets, but but I do appreciate him being able to tell his story, the, the original Colin Kaepernick and standing against standing. Um, uh, and they remind us in that documentary what I saw in live time as a, as a young sports fan at that time. White folks were so angry at him for, for displaying his decolonial process on national TV that during the national anthem that one of their little white children was singing, they out voiced that child in booing him. So if you really cared that much about this all important anthem whose third verse is extremely white supremacist, racist, and defending of slavery and, and, and indentured servitude for whites and violently killing them for not wanting to fight for the United States. So I don't know why anybody would want to be, you know, defending that anthem in the first place. But instead of defending it as they would want to, they they drowned out their own song to to shun him and his peaceful standing, by the way, protest. This is why we get not only Brittany Griner getting locked up, but all of the wild responses that I saw uh, in the aftermath. This is also why you get, of course, and I can't wait for the next panel. I can't wait. I, I'm, I can't wait. But, but this is why you get the Deion Sanders HBCU nonsense. And this abuse of, and, and, and for no disrespect to the Bowie Morgan whatever, but in this we're unified. I was, I felt totally disrespected as an HBCU supporter uh, and professor by that whole exchange and the way it was described and the way all of this took place and then he left to go to Colorado. This is also why you get Obama being able to be called in to tell the ball players don't go on strike. This is why you get Caitlin Clark, like it or not, representing the colonizer and the media responding accordingly in this case uh, also like it or not to the Angel Reese representation of the colonized response that they don't like. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done that before. <laughs> but now I want to do it everywhere. 
What's up, Dr. Ball? How you doing? <laughs> In the hallway, everywhere. <laughs> anyway, and this is why, unfortunately, last night, I mean, it was it was brutal to hear this. For me, uh, uh, selfishly, admittedly, it was brutal to hear that in the aftermath of Len Bias's passing, Ronald Reagan would send his mother flowers. You, and if anyone is not aware of the longevity of this man's hatred of the world and black people in particular, and thankfully, as I like to remind people all the time, he died during my wedding and we raised a glass. Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, well, I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. But if you if you feel a kind of way about me doing that, check his record and then check your political situation and education and consciousness. Because Reagan, like like what he said in the boondocks was the devil. And I'm an atheist. I don't even believe in this stuff. So anyway, just <laughs> he was still the devil. I, he, he was what I anyway. So 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 anyway. That was disturbing, but it was perfect because, of course, they're not, they're not, they don't care about the passing of the humanity, the loss of life, the loss of African life. The, the, the concern was all that you do and could do and could have done for us is lost. It's disgusting that he would do that. And this is why we would get William C. Roden writing a book called $40 Million Slaves and the response that it in it, it uh, uh garnered where he would have to remind people look i was the title is a quote from what larry johnson said in response to a reporter's critique and is meant to reflect what i'm here to talk a little bit about and wrapping up here to talk about this relationship this ongoing relationship that starts with colonization and enslavement and maintains itself in new ways all the way through today so then lastly just to to to, to wrap up um this is why I agree with Ben Carrington, who says, I argue that the black athletic body, male and female, has become a powerful signifier within contemporary media culture. The signifier that has increasingly served to redefine, in some sense, reduce the agency of embodied freedom into a narrow set of power and performance motifs that are radically decontextualized from broader, broader political movements, thus separating the black body from any con connection to social change and hence to a depolitization of the black athlete itself. I read that quickly, it says a lot, but long story short, this is why I do not blame individual athletes for their decisions. I'm not justifying their decisions or whatever roles that they play, but I'm trying to understand their function and what, their, what is done to them is meant to be done to us, to depoliticize us, and therefore we shouldn't and cannot expect to see celebrity athletes leading some revolution. Very lastly, and this is the point I was getting at about the colonialism and the role that colonialism has, I mean, the role the sport has been meant to play in that context. In, in describing the conquering of uh, the Dominican Republic, Luis Perez cites, um, oh, I've lost the title, of the, uh, uh, a, a, a military official from the United States who says, quote, I deem it worthy of the department, that is the Department of Defense, notice that the American game of baseball is being played and supported here with great enthusiasm. He's talking about Dominican Republic in 1890. So it's not the Department of Defense. So the department must be some other war department or some other department. Um, but he's talking about 1898 in D Dominican Republic. The remarkable effect of this outlet for the animal spirits of the young men is that they are leaving the plazas where they were in the habit of congregating and talking revolution and are resorting to the are resorting to the ball fields where they become wildly partisan each for his favorite team. The importance of this new interest should not be minimized. It satisfies a craving in the nature of the people for exciting conflict and is a real substitute for the contest in the hillsides with rifles. If we could be fostered, if it could be fostered and made important by a league of teams, it well might be one a factor in the salvation of the nation, end quote. The point being putting people in teams, organizing leagues, structuring, giving them uniforms and team names and, and, and giving them structure around which to outlet this energy is seen as a, as a part of a, co a colonizing process that's meant to keep African people from rebelling. Give them baseball bats and they won't pick up rifles and go to the hills. So anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, and I hope we have a few minutes for some Q&A.